afternoon to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, what we have done today is divided this really into two parts. The first part is a very complex case. In fact, one where I've emailed many colleagues in ICOS to ask them their advice and if they've had any experience with this issue. And um, it's uh, even got some updated data from yesterday. So we've got that case that then arrives into the COVID era. And then I wanted to discuss a bit about COVID in general for cardiology, some uh, insights into what we had to go through with our cardio-oncology service here in London, which of course was one of the sort of cities most affected by this. And then finally, uh, show you some new information on a modern imaging tool that we employed in our uh, patients coming through the intensive care unit here at the Brompton with COVID and what that might show us about their th prothrombotic state. Now, normally, uh, my our fellow Sol Andres, who is from Buenos Aires, but has been with us for over, uh, over a year or six months to nine months at the moment, will be presenting. But unfortunately, she's not able to be with us in the hospital today. So I'm going to present uh, on her behalf this case that I've been looking after. Uh, but a big thanks to Sol for preparing the case. So this is a 66 year old lady and her history from a cardiovascular perspective goes back to 2006. And she was actually mugged at an airport. So had a very stressful event returning into the UK. And this led to severe chest pain. And she presented with an acute coronary syndrome with ST elevation and inferior leads, raised troponin, and therefore came for a urgent primary PCI. But what was found was that she had a dissection with occlusion of her distal right coronary artery, but without evidence of atherosclerosis. And she therefore proceeded to have coronary stenting to open this dissection. And you can discuss and debate whether the role of that, that's for another day. And that the stenting procedure was then complicated by a coronary perforation leading to tamponade that required emergency needle pericardius and tesis. And then in the week to 10 days after that procedure, she represented with a post pericardius and tesis Dresler syndrome. And this was on the background of a history of some borderline hypertension, but never needed treatment and hypercholesterolemia. And we've got the angiogram from this time. So this is 2006, and this is the right coronary angiogram, which shows that the right coronary artery, as it sort of turns 90 degrees to become the PDA, is occluded, uh, just as you can see it behind the catheter there. And this is the post PCI angiogram showing the stent sitting there, and now this opened large posterior descending artery. I want to also highlight to you to look at the other vessels coming off her right coronary system, which look slightly tortuous, but otherwise healthy and normal. So from an oncology perspective, her history is of a previous ovarian cancer that required unilateral ephrectomy, but no adjuvant treatment. And then thyroid cancer, a follicular thyroid cancer initially diagnosed in 2013, requiring surgery, thyroidectomy and adjuvant radioactive iodine. Unfortunately, she represented in 2014 with a vertebral metastasis, initially treated with localized cyberknife radiotherapy. In 2019, she presented with liver metastases. And again, these were treated with cyber knife radiotherapy and with very good effect. And during the assessment, she was also found to have a recurrent growth of the previous vertebral metastasis. So she had a relatively large metastasis in the T6 region of her spine, and this was surgically treated with debulking. However, within five months of surgery, there was evidence of recurrent disease progression in that location. And having previously had radiotherapy to the area and surgery, the oncologist wanted to start a tyrosine kinase inhibitor called lenvatinib. And given her prior history of the coronary dissection, myocardial infarction, and 
the Dresler syndrome, this patient was referred to us for a pre-lenvatinib cardio-oncology review. So when I saw her in September 2019, she was asymptomatic from a cardiac perspective. Her baseline cardiac biomarkers were normal given she'd had this previous MI. Her only cardiac medication was aspirin. She had a normal blood pressure. Her resting echocardiogram showed her LV function was normal, both in measuring her ejection fraction and on global longitudinal strain. And although she had this uh, inferior infarction story, there was no clear regional motion abnormality on echocardiography. And there was a mild mitral valve prolapse, but with no significant regurgitation. Thinking about lenvatinib, it can cause QT prolongation, so we always check an ECG for the baseline corrected QT interval, which was normal, and she had Q waves in the inferior leads. Now, because of this unusual story, I decided to do a cardiac MRI at baseline just to be certain, had she had an infarct, what was going on? Had she got any evidence of constrictive physiology, although the echo wouldn't suggest that given her previous Dresler's pericarditis. On the top left, you see a sort of four chamber view and it looks like the left ventricle has normal dimensions and good systolic function. Here in a short axis, you can see the left ventricle, and I think you could persuade yourself there is an inferior regional wall motion abnormality compared to the anterior septal and lateral walls. It just doesn't look as though it's thickening quite a lot. And in line with that, slightly different orientation now, but you see this late gadolinium enhancement, uh, which is subendocardial on the late GAD, consistent with an inferior infarct. So the, L, the cardiac MRI reports confirm normal volumes, this mild thinning and achinesia with this infarct, uh, normal right ventricular function. We did an inflammatory sequence and it showed no evidence of active inflammation in either her myocardium or pericardium and this infarct. And I also did a perfusion scan just as part of the protocol to ensure she had no ischemia, thinking that VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors can cause uh, ischemia and uh, given her coronary story, we just needed to be certain what we were dealing with. So that's her pre-treatment MRI. So my advice was, as with all patients who start tyrosine kinase inhibitors that inhibit VEGF amongst other kinases to start a home blood pressure diary. And if the blood pressure rises, we need to know. We discussed the option of prophylactic drugs such as an ACE inhibitor, but actually she was happy for us just to continue with close monitoring. She's fit to start lenvatinib. And given this previous cardiac history, I recommended we reassessed her about two to four weeks after starting this oral drug, which is what I generally recommend for patients with a, a higher risk phenotype starting a VEGF inhibitor, whether it's for thyroid cancer, renal cancer, liver cancer, and so forth. Now, what happened with this lady was a very unusual syndrome. So she started lenvatinib, and it was the standard dose. And within 48 hours, she had a hypertensive crisis. So her blood pressure went up to 200 over 100, with associated with chest pain that was cardiac, breathlessness, and therefore we advised her to initially go to her local A&E for an immediate assessment because that was the closest point of contact and safety. There, her resting ECG did not have any acute changes, but she had a very high troponin of over 2,000 on their assay. So clearly we advised them to stop lenvatinib, to start managing this as an acute coronary syndrome in the context of being recently started on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and also to manage this hypertensive crisis. So there was a combination of uh, adding clopidogrel to her aspirin and therapeutic low molecular weight heparin and then also starting IVGTN, lisinopril, amlodipine because the high blood pressure was so high and she was also quite anxious and tachycardic and so a lower dose of bisoprolol was also added. And we arranged for an urgent inpatient transfer to us for further investigations. So of course this lady needed a coronary angiogram. This is her left coronary system and you'll see it's clear, smooth and unobstructed. This is her right coronary angiogram and 
this is actually rather interesting. And of course, we have the benefit of the previous one. So there were two abnormalities noted. First, if you see the mouse, you can see there's an aneurysm in the proximal right coronary artery that wasn't previously there in 2006. Secondly, the, the stented part of her posterior descending coronary artery is open and patent and the distal vessel looks good but we see some very unusual changes in the other branches of her right coronary artery. These sort of posterior lateral branches look very diseased, but it's not discrete atherosclerotic plaques and more reminiscent of a vasculitis type problem. And also if you look at the sort of uh, further uh, branch up here, similar pattern of sort of an ectatic followed by stenotic. So, we're dealing at this stage with a lady who's recently started a, a, a lenvatinib and has some very unusual new changes to her distal right coronary artery branches. Um, so did she have an acute vasculitis? So we again performed a cardiac MRI uh, with the troponin rise. Is it vasculitis? Is it ischemia in this territory? Should we be considering uh, immunosuppression? And what we found was, to our surprise, the territory supplied by those vessels was relatively normal apart from the previous infarct that we knew about. But the remaining territory was, uh, did not show any signs of acute edema or ischemia. However, in the basal portions of her uh, left ventricle in the right coronary and lateral territory, we saw signs of elevated T1, uh, elevated T2, and a increased signal on the T2 stir. And this all is suggestive of acute inflammation. So we now have the benefit, because she had a previous MRI only a few weeks earlier as part of her baseline, to be able to say, well, there wasn't any inflammation there before, so this is a new phenomenon, but it's in a different area of the heart than where those changes from the blood vessels of the distal right coronary artery are. So we now have a woman who's started lenvatinib within 48 hours. She's had a hypertensive crisis, chest pain, significant troponin rise. She's got evidence of some changes and abnormalities in her distal right coronary artery that look vasculitic, but the area of edema is different and is more proximal, not really in a coronary territory. And so, is this a tyrosine kinase inhibitor mediated myocarditis? I think at the moment, that's what our, our working conclusion was, maybe aggravated or generated by the hypertensive uh, uh, crisis. And at the, we felt that actually, because there was no inflammatory sequence uh, or evidence of inflammation in the area where those distal blood vessels were abnormal, they may actually be chronically abnormal and be a result of the previous Dresler's pericarditis. And maybe she did have a rheumatological inflammatory condition that made her susceptible back in 2006 to the dissection, the pericarditis after the tamponade and that there was a vas localized vasculitis in that time that has then burnt out and that we're just seeing older changes. This was her troponin level, initially, as I say, very high at 2000, and with management of hypertension, antiplatelets, low molecular weight heparin, it came down. So this is without any steroid or immunosuppression. This is taken from uh, Javid's paper on the definition of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And of course, when we think of drug-induced myocarditis, if you have positive evidence of a new inflammation on an MRI, plus a convincing syndrome and a rise in a biomarker, then it's pretty substantiated. So at the moment, this lady fits that diagnostic category or by it for, that it's a TKI mediated myocarditis rather than uh, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor as written there. 
And that's why I actually emailed around many colleagues in ICOS to say, had anybody seen this before? And to my knowledge, nobody had, although if anybody on the line today has ever had a myocarditis driven by a TKI, I'd be very interested to hear or if a hypertensive crisis for whatever reason, it may be cardio-oncology patient, maybe a regular hypertensive patient has led to acute inflammation in the heart, then I suppose that could be another mechanism I'd be interested to hear. Although it was very regional rather than global. So I felt that went against it being only the hypertension. Yeah, uh, Alex, uh, this is Dan. The Hi, Dan. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. What a fantastic uh, case. So, so what I'm going to do, can I suggest, Dan, I stop here and we discuss this case, and then I've got a bit more to add about COVID. But yeah. shall I just tell you the final bit of this case, and then I'll pause and we can open it for discussion? Sure. So, so Sounds good. I'm open-minded, but based on this data, this is our current working diagnosis, lenvatinib-induced myocarditis that was aggravated by hypertension and that there was a previous vasculitis. We did do an autoimmune screen and none of her antibodies came back positive to suggest she's currently got a anchor or other mediated vasculitis, but she clearly had an autoimmune phenotype. So we treated her with lisinopril, amlodipine, bisoprolol. I monitored her as an outpatient. She became asymptomatic. Her blood pressure actually all returned to normal such that we had to wean her off the amlodipine, bisoprolol. She developed a bit of a cough. So ultimately, as you'll see, we then switched her to, to candesartan. Unfortunately, this vertebral disease progressed. And so she had some more radiotherapy with her oncologist. And then I got a phone call from the oncologist in April in the middle of the storm of the COVID pandemic in London, saying that, that she was getting further spinal cord compression from this metastasis. The surgeons didn't feel with the oncologist that another debulking is going to provide a long-term benefit. She's really exhausted radiotherapy what did I feel about her having a re-challenge? Now, forget COVID, she's clearly a very high risk for re-challenging, but conversely, what's the alternative? Now, this is a picture they sent me yesterday, so I'm sorry for the quality, but this is this lady's most recent spinal MRI. And there's, of course, the vertebral column, there's the spinal cord in black with the white fluid around it. And here, coming out of the T6 vertebra is this huge mass, and you can see it's directly in contact with her spinal cord. So she's, and this is at the level of T6. So if left untreated, she's got imminent sort of uh, paralysis plus the loss of bladder and rectal functions. So the question is, could we do something else? So what we decided to do was to switch to a different TKI, and in the case of thyroid cancer, the second line to be considered as serafinib. You can argue whether serafinib is more or less cardiotoxic than lenvatinib. Certainly to me, it's not benign, it's pretty cardiotoxic. So I said, we've got to start at a really low dose. So the standard starting dose is 200 milligrams twice daily. So we instead, in, initiated this at 25% of the dose. And she started this on Monday whilst taking candesartan. And yesterday, her blood pressure had already gone from a normal baseline up to that. So we've doubled up her candesartan, and I'm speaking to her this afternoon to hear how she's getting on. But clearly, this lady's extremely sensitive to this type of treatment. She's not had any chest pain, but is uh, we're going to have to monitor, use high doses of drugs if we're going to keep her on this. And the, certainly, my conversation with the oncologist is we're not going to up titrate this. We're going to keep her on serafinib at this dose and see if it responds. And maybe she's got a very active sort of VEGF biological activity in her body. So I think I'm going to 
close the case here and open it up for discussion. I'd be really interested if anyone had any ideas about the cause of the inflammation and that as the cause of a troponin rise and if there's anything you would do differently. So Alex, what uh, what was the pathology of her cancer? So she's got metastatic follicular thyroid cancer. And if I go back a few slides, if you didn't catch the beginning, um, I'll just show you. So that's her oncology history. So this primary resection 2013, vertebral metastasis with cyber knife radiotherapy 2014, liver metastasis, further cyber knife with a very good response. So a liver disease is quiescent, but the previous vertebral metastasis had enlarged. She got surgical debulking, but it never removed it completely. So within five months, she got further disease progression and hence initially the indication for the systemic treatment. And if you missed it before, she had previously a it's a very stressful event leading to an acute coronary syndrome, which was actually a dissection of her distal right coronary artery. And that when it was stented, it then perforated the vessels. So she got tamponade, acute pericardias and tesis. And then in the week to 10 days afterwards, the sort of post pericardiotomy type Dresler syndrome that went on for several months. And that together with dissecting her right coronary artery, I suspect she had a sort of autoimmune or rheumatological predisposition to something uh, <laughs> rather than atherosclerosis, because she doesn't have atherosclerosis. Um, and that was her previous coronary angiogram back in 20, 2006 with the acutely occluded but dissected um, sponta from the spontaneous dissection that she presented with and uh, then there's the stented vessel and these vessels were all okay then whereas I've shown you if you go forwards this is her pre-lenvatinib MRI with no inflammation and an old infarct and no ischemia and then she left coronary artery systems fine when she presented with this high troponin rise chest pain and acute hypertensive storm and now look at these vessels they all look very sort of vasculitic diseased but diffuse thready ectatic and stenotic areas including this that up there whereas interestingly the stented vessel was fine so the the thing that this sort of two or three comments number one was in terms of the first line therapy for thyroid cancer, not necessarily papillary, but uh, thyroid cancer in general would be vendetinib. Uh, was that thought of as an option? Uh, so this, is a, this was a follicular thyroid cancer. And I think the data on that, you know, I think lenvatinib is quite a standard first line VEGF TKI for follicular thyroid cancer in the UK. And I guess I don't can't comment about other countries in Europe, but we see lots of people where lenvatinib is their first TKI for systemic disease of metastatic thyroid cancer. But you're right, there are some where vendatinib is used first and then uh, serafinib is often the second line when they failed the first line. And then the other thing is, uh, so, you know, if you're trying to connect her spontaneous dissection in 2006 to whatever is happening now and, and say that there's some underlying disease proclivity to, to you know, uh, coronary events that was exacerbated by her treatment and her cancer, then, you know, I think that that is certainly a logical thing to try to sort through. It, now, was she on a statin during all this time or? No, and in fact, we did a CT coronary angiogram, which I haven't shown, and she's got no atheroma. She doesn't have atherosclerotic but, coronary disease. Her her, her her cholesterol has been sort of uh, I would say higher than optimal on in someone if you're just thinking about optimal prevention but in the context of someone with no known atheroma I think I think whatever the disease is it's not atherosclerosis whether a statin would help microvascular 
issues and physiology of course you know lots of people use it in that indication but i'm not clear whether that, that would help here well the only reason why i uh, would suggest it, it would be that if you if you are trying to connect 2006 to the present day uh you know some sort of uh, innate endothelial dysfunction could be a unifying theme throughout for, yeah. for this patient. And anybody who has endothelial dysfunction in some form or another, I would probably want them to be on a statin just for to try to stabilize the endothelium. But yeah. when when you look at the two coronary angiograms, you know, the one you did before and then the one you did after when she came in with the really high troponin, you know, that looks like the same, I hadn't seen many, but I've seen a few uh, angiograms of people that are that are getting nilotinib for CML and they have progressive atherosclerosis. Mm. Uh, you know, when you, when you see a rapid change in their, uh, you know, uh, anatomy in their vessels yeah. that, you know, so, I don't so know if this was, is some if sort this of clock, I would, you know, you'd immediately but the other thing, Dan, to remember is she's only been on lenvatinib for 48 hours when this acute event happened. And this area is all supplying the sort of apical half of her right coronary artery territory, whereas the inflammation is all up in the basal portion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that thinking that some sort of vasculitis occurred is certainly uh, an appropriate thought. I, I don't know how you prove that, but uh, uh, I mean, just looking at the angiogram, it did make me think of what happens with with nilotinib. So. Yeah, and and the other point is she's now tried a second drug and it's doing the same thing. So you're, I fully agree that her physiology whether it's her innate physiology because of an underlying rheumatological condition even if it's seronegative or in the context of having this malignancy as well um she's very sensitive to vegf tkis certainly from a systemic blood pressure perspective so um does yeah, anybody I mean, else, has anybody else seen a case like this or got any other comments no but i think that you know, just to finish out on what you just said that you know, obviously, if you if you pull together the 2006 event and you say she has a very sensitive endothelium and then she has this profound reaction to anti-VEGF therapy, we, we do know that anti-VEGF therapy has a big impact on your endothelium. Hmm. I agree with that, certainly. Any other comments from the audience? Hi, Alex. It's Veronica from Brazil. How are you? Veronica, hello. Yes. How are I'm you? Good. I'm sorry to hear in the news that Sao Paulo yes. has been hit so hard. I hope you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> me too. And our friend Ariane is working very hard on it. Yeah. So we are very proud about her work here in the front of COVID people here. But uh, I have just one question about the global longitudinal strain that were, was normal in this patient, as you mentioned. But is there any any special uh, things to say about segmental, segmental abnormalities in this strain analysis? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. So, of course, by definition, the GLS is an average you're across all the different segments of the yeah. LV. I can't quote you, but I'm sure that her inferior longitudinal strain would have been abnormal in the area of that infarct, but the infarct was relatively modest in size, and so it's lost uh, when you average it out across all the segments. Um, I'm ha I'd be very interested to know if anybody is aware of any study that has specifically looked at outcomes based on regional 
uh, uh, low, longitudinal strain abnormalities or even radial versus the global calculated values. Because really the majority of the studies done and thinking ahead to the SUCA trial results is all based on the global longitudinal strain. Um, and certainly in cardio-oncology, that's where I've seen the literature. But again, Dan or anybody know about actual sort of hard clinical outcomes related just to regional abnormalities? Yeah, I Lips. think... Oh, hello. Oh, sorry. Hello. So, so, so I'm Teresa. Sorry. Teresa. Uh, Teresa from from Madrid. No, no. I have the, I I have the, the same opinion as as you. Uh, we have a lot of uh, information regarding segmental strain in patients with ischemic heart disease, but not in the field of cardio oncology. So to predict the event in cancer patient related to, to cardiac toxicity or to different drugs is global longitudinal strain, what we generally you know, use. And there is also some experience with um, circumferential strain, but probably the reproducibility is less than with uh, ELS, uh, generally speaking. Yeah. Okay, and Dan, did you have something you wanted to add? And then maybe I can move on to the second part of the talk about COVID. Sure. The, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, we have looked at uh, regional strain in, using cardiac MRI and uh, particularly a myostrain technology, which is yeah. uh, looking at, uh, it's an automated calculation of, of region, regional and global strain. And we are working on trying to get this information published, but basically uh, we do see very sensitive change in patients that are undergoing chemotherapy that are having some evidence of cardiotoxicity. You can see regional changes much sooner than you do global changes. But the problem, at least uh, in, in the echo world is that you know, there may be too many segments that drop out of your average uh, global longitudinal strain, you know, calculation. Yeah. But with, with the MRI, you don't get nearly as much dropout, so you can actually analyze those regional segments. So we're uh, cautiously optimistic about that technology, but it hasn't, uh, hasn't made it to prime time yet. Yeah. So the other Alex facts... Oh, yes, so, Teresa. Sorry, yes. sorry. May I make a, yes, a, a short comment because you are uh, talking about uh, a high vascular sensitivity of uh, this patient, but uh, probably one concept that uh, arises when we review this patient in similar patient in, in our clinic is that uh, uh, the first or the second um, line or, or treatment the patient receives. Is, is what it makes more sensitive to, to the next uh, treatment. So probably it's like yeah. a cardiotoxicity memory, like we speak about, uh, I don't know, electrical memory. Well, this yeah. could be, uh, it makes sense that uh, it could happen in, in these patients. I think it certainly could. I mean, when you talk about memory, it's probably about some sort of epigenetic modification on gene expression, isn't it, in the tissues involved. So. Uh, I think that's very plausible. Obviously, we have let the best part of s sort of five months to six months pass from VEGF TKI number one, which he only had for 48 hours, to this assessment, but or rechallenge, shall we say? But but I fully agree. And unpicking what is about the um, underlying sort of sensitivity of this individual and her genotype for that versus mm -hmm. what's gone on with the first episode. And again, I mean, as I'm presenting it, because some of the things just didn't make sense, even at the time. I mean, you could say, well, if this lady's got a, a, a systemic endothelial sensitivity, why was only one portion of her coronary artery system involved in the vascular looking changes? Why was only one segment of the myocardium involved during the acute event? Why wasn't it all global? You know, what, what's different about the the uh, endothelial function in her systemic arteries that's making her blood pressure go up, her right coronary, but not her left. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, there are some bits to this case that still, you know, puzzle me and that I want to, to uh, present it and share it with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so one of the challenges was the fact that when I first got told about the disease progression, it was actually in April in the middle of the pandemic. And at that point, and I'm going to come to this, taking people who are stable out of a point of safety, that's their home in isolation, to bring them in for a treatment that might well give them a, a, a complication, um, a high risk patient, myself and the oncologist discussed this and felt that actually there was a little bit of time to defer. So we agreed the plan was to re-challenge, but we actually delayed the re-challenge until we felt the COVID epidemic had at least subsided sufficiently that if she does get unwell, is readmitted with another cardiac event, that actually the safety of being admitted into a hospital was less. So that has brought us into this new concept that we're not just thinking about sort of this benefit risk balance of cardiovascular disease versus oncology disease, which is what we live and breathe the whole time with cardio oncology. But this concept now of the risk of COVID out there in society and unfortunately in London, it's really settling down. We don't know if we'll have a second wave, but of course, it's still very active in certain areas of the United States and certainly in Southern America and areas of Africa at the moment. So it does change your approach to whether you start high risk treatment uh, in this environment. So I'm going to start by saying I'm not an expert on COVID. I'm not sure if anybody is really an expert. So I'm going to do a presentation that covers the background of it, focusing on cardiovascular issues, talk about what I and our team here experienced and how we responded to it from a cardio-oncology service, and then finish with some interesting new technology that shows us some insights into the pathology of the disease. So I'm gonna start with what's called the standard timeline, which is the first cases were reported in Wuhan in China in December, 2019. There was this very large outbreak in Northern Italy in February, 2020. And the first cases in the UK were starting to be seen in February, 2020. And by March, there was a WHO pandemic. So my first comment, and this is just being provocative is, is this all really true? And the reason is now that some of us have seen quite a lot of COVID patients, you start to look back at other patients who were doing weird things before. So I've spoken to some colleagues who actually think they've seen COVID patients with unusual pneumonitis and pneumonias in December and patients that would fit now what we understand. We know from France, a pathologist in France has gone back to some pneumonia tissue samples from Paris from patients in December and detected it on COVID. So we know actually COVID was in Europe at least in December and possibly earlier than December. And I've seen a case, not a cardio-oncology case, but a patient who was admitted to another hospital, severe pneumonitis and pneumonia. It was all, quotes, infected, but they never found an organism. And he just gradually got better. He went into AF, which is why then he was referred to me as an outpatient. And he turned up with acute liver failure and had a very bizarre transient liver failure syndrome that then recovered. And at the time we were wondering, was it mycoplasma? Was it something else? But if this case turned up today, we'd just say, well, this is COVID. So he needs antibody. And that was in, in January. We know the scale of this data I got last night. So in the UK, almost 250,000 confirmed cases, but that's only based on who accesses the swabs or the antibodies. 35,500 deaths and globally it's approaching 5 million people confirmed and over 325,000 deaths. This is the sort of scale of what was detected from this sort of air time in March. This is the UK data and then the global data here going up to 5 million. So clearly we were all looking for it in from mid-March, but we've probably missed cases earlier. 
I just wanted to give you this as a context. This must be, I guess, the same in the countries like Spain and Italy and maybe the US that were most affected. So this is data from our UK Office of National Statistics yesterday. So in the data from March and April, so two months, there were 33,800 deaths, 95% had COVID assigned as the cause. And to put that in context, the number of COVID deaths in this two month window would be the, the third highest cause of death for the whole of 2018. So it's like one of the most common causes of death for a year all squashed into two months. And many of these patients, of course, as we know, have some form of pre-existing risk factors. There's just a quick plot of the date timeline from March to April, the number of deaths, the blue line in the middle here is the five year average, so it's pretty stable. And then you've got the real data from this year in yellow, and then the COVID deaths in the lighter blue clearly driving this peak and increase. Fortunately, as you can see, tailing down. And if you look at the causes of death as a standardized mortality rate per population of 100,000 people compared to all the other things we know, including ischemic heart disease, various cancers, lung cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer, you can see this dramatic rise. So what are the risk factors? Well, why is it relevant to cardio-oncology? It's pretty obvious that people with heart disease have a higher risk and people with cancer have a higher risk. So in fact, our population have this sort of very high risk. Age is clearly important. So again, this is the UK data just showing the mortality. And we do see deaths in younger people, but really it's with increasing age. This is a paper which is, uh, I think, now available online, but it's not come out certainly in the issue yet. So I thank Marco Metra, who's the final author. He's based at Brescia in northern Italy, so right in the eye of the storm. And they've published in the European Heart Journal this paper, which I suggest you read because it's got interesting insights, albeit in a, a relatively small population, 99 patients. But what they describe is the cohort who had cardiac disease versus those without. Here are the risk factors, and you can see that smoking is essentially the same, diabetes is the same, there's more hypertension and dyslipidemia in the cardiac group, although a reasonable amount of hypertension there. And then the definition of cardiovascular disease is already having had heart failure, AF, coronary disease, prior cardiac surgery, or a percutaneous valve. And of course, because the average age is about 67, in this population that was admitted with COVID, so that's another caveat, this is a hospitalized population, then there's quite a lot of pre-existing cardiac disease. And it wouldn't surprise you if you look at the survival here as a Kaplan-Meier against days following admission that the patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease have a much worse outcome in mortality compared to those without. And if you look across the bottom for ARDS, venous thromboembolism, arterial thromboembolism, sepsis, and then mortality, comparing the blue bar of without cardiac disease to the red bar with, the pre-existing heart disease is clearly a major risk factor. I think we're also learning that COVID can trigger the presentation of a range of acute cardiac illnesses. Uh, this was nicely summarized by Leslie Cooper and colleagues in their circulation review. And this is a table from that review that's sort of been adapted. So you've got acute coronary syndromes. And I think more and more we think that COVID may destabilize a pre-existing plaque by inflammation. Then you've got some form of myocardial injuries that occur without obstructive coronary disease, so troponin rises, and they, and they come from a whole range of different potential causes, uh, but mainly in this list here for heart failure. So you've got new heart failure, sometimes with proven myocarditis, sometimes just 
uh, non-inflammatory heart failure, sometimes Takatsubu syndrome. And of course, if you've got someone who's already got heart failure, an acute on chronic episode, lots of thromboembolic com uh, complications, both venous thromboembolism and arterial, which I'll come back to, and some patients presenting with acute arrhythmia. So you can imagine if you're the acute cardiac service of any small, medium or large hospital and COVID is in the community, you're going to get these present patients presenting with what looks like just a regular thing, but actually is being driven by COVID. There's still a, only early understanding of the biology of this, um, but some of this is related to the direct viral invasion and direct infection and damage into the heart. Maybe the some people COVID infects the heart myocytes and causes a myocarditis. Then there's the systemic inflammatory response like cytokine release syndromes that we see in the CAR T cell patients and so and sort of people with meningitis or after major trauma. And it's the cytokine storm sort of a bit more non-specifically that causes either myocarditis or plaque rupture. There's certainly value of measuring the biomarkers in patients presenting so that if you have cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease and a raised troponin, the mortality in, in this group from China was huge, almost 70% versus those without cardiovascular disease and without a troponin rise where yes there was still a concerning mortality but sort of tenfold less so measuring troponin as one biomarker certainly offers prognostic value you can also see in this same paper that compared to the admission troponin the patients where it rose during the hospital had a much worse outcome, this cohort dying versus those where their troponin stayed relatively low. So there's something active progressing during, I believe, the sort of first week with the viremia in people susceptible to the direct viral infection, and in the second and third week from the inflammatory response when the virus maybe is no longer present. And there's the same value for BNP or NT pro BNP. So these two pretty regularly available biomarkers are useful. This is um, another paper that shows some of the significance of myocardial injury and the role again of troponin and here myoglobin of being able to uh, be quite sensitive and specific for predicting severe outcomes and, and in this case mortality from COVID. And the Northern Italian group, again, troponin on the left, NT pro BMP on the right, just comparing uh, the cohorts who survived in green from those who died. And the, if, if these go up, it's bad news. So the cardiovascular involvement is one of the main drivers of inpatient mortality. This was a paper again that showed uh, from China the importance of troponin rise and the reason I put this up is when they list their baseline characteristics they did see a small group nine patients who'd got cancer and again those with a troponin rise and cancer had a much higher mortality compared to those without when you looked and followed it up so uh, our cancer patients may be a, a higher risk particularly if they've had previous cardiotoxic uh, treatments of troponin elevation. So there's also the story of heart failure. So here again from the Northern Italy group, if you look down at which factors actually predicted worse outcome, this is increased mortality risk, then heart failure patients had a higher mortality and the group with a history of cancer, again, relatively small numbers, but again, the wrong side of the line of unity showing that these patients are at elevated risk. This was a nice paper you might have seen from Mandeep Meher and colleagues who again took a registry data. So this isn't a trial population, this is from registry data, but looking at predictors of in-hospital death in COVID patients, age again increases coronary disease, heart failure, arrhythmia, and COPD, all increased risk. So is being a smoker. And uh, I think we'll learn that other drugs of abuse taking is also risk. 
What was important about this study is there was initially a story that ACE inhibitors and ARBs might increase the infection risk by upregulating ACE2 in patients taking them. It's the converse. If you're on an ACE inhibitor, you were protected according to this data set. Obviously, that needs to be tested prospectively, but certainly there isn't an evidence of harm from being on an ACE inhibitor in these patients who got COVID. I must admit, I still disentangle it into two parts. There's being getting the infection if exposed, and we don't know whether being on an ACE or an ARB upregulating ACE2 increases your risk of getting an infection if you're exposed. But the counterbalance to that is if you do get the infection, being on these drugs might be prote protective against the surge of angiotensin that may accompany COVID-19 infection. And this is sort of looks at the different pathophysiological ways which you can end up with myocardial damage, both through sort of a metabolic drive of the um, of, of sympathetic activation and the hypoxia associated with the pneumonitis, the systemic inflammatory response, inflammation of the endothelium and the myocardium, either by the virus or by the systemic inflammatory response. And then the story that the virus down regulates ACE2 because it binds to it and basically internalizes the ACE2 from the surface of the vessels or the um, alveolar cells. That leads to a rise in angiotensin 2 because ACE2 is like a natural ACE inhibitor in our bodies. So then your angiotensin 2 rises and that leads to all the problems of angiotensin 2 elevation, which you are familiar with, um, and ischemia. So on balance, at the moment, we've not been routinely stopping ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients because there was that early concern about increased risk, um, and they seem to be probably beneficial in the people who do have the problem. There is a case in the literature and a few more emerging of acute myocarditis. So here on the MRI showing acute inflammation and where biopsies have then shown the presence of COVID in the myocardium. So there are some people who get a viral myocarditis. So in the last few minutes, I'll just show you what we've been up to here at the Brompton in London. So I've alluded to the fact all our cardio-oncology patients by definition are high risk. So they're all being told by our government to shield, stay at home, get other people to get their food, do the shopping, not to leave isolation. And you can imagine a huge amount of anxiety with these patients should they come out of their shielding and isolation to go and have their echo because they're still on Herceptin, what happens if they start getting cardiac symptoms. Uh, so all this risk benefit discussion about leaving home, continuing treatment or starting a cardiotoxic treatment. We moved all our consultations from face to face to remote through phone call or video call and managed to deliver 138 remote consultations, including assessing 34 new referrals initially remotely. We had staff redeployments to different hospitals and to our intensive care units as we went from one to three intensive care wards. We moved our MDT that of course traditionally is all everyone in the same room to Microsoft Teams for virtual MDTs to try and minimize contact between team members. And for new outpatients, well, first of all, we sort of sent a communication to all our oncology and cancer surgeons and anesthetist colleagues to basically say, if you've got a new urgent referral, phone us first so we can discuss the case and sort of do a triage of who actually needs to come and have any tests and who we could sensibly defer cancer treatment and therefore defer any need for a cardiac assessment. So obviously that's on a case by case basis. And because the cancer hospital did stay open for patients visiting, then with our echo teams in their hospital, we were able to offer some ongoing echo in appropriate high risk patients or symptomatic patients through the visit to the oncology center rather than bringing them out to come to the cardiac center. And where advanced cardiac imaging was required, stress echo, dobutamine only, so we stopped doing physiological stress echo because of aerosol risk, CT, cardiac MRI, or 
other types of tests such as halter monitors in symptomatic patients, those could still be arranged, but with a much higher threshold for considering them. The surveillance patients were really divided into the highest risk patients who'd had pre-existing heart failure or significant LV impairment back on treatment where we couldn't stop surveillance versus others where we just did some phone calls and just if they'd been very stable, all the previous echoes and biomarkers had been stable for a long period, we could start to increase the length between surveillance episodes to avoid the risk. Um, and so it's this whole issue about the, the new risk. And finally, survivors, essentially, they've all been deferred uh, till after the COVID pandemic has cleared unless they've been referred because of symptomatic heart failure. This is part of a figure from a great sort of article that is coming out with Jörg Herman and Dan Lenehan as the leaders of this paper uh, about the ICOS opinion and guidance on managing how you deliver a cardio-oncology co uh, service during COVID. And I think we're very familiar with balancing cardiovascular risk versus cancer risk and who to stop and start different treatments. But now we've got the COVID risk and that this will change. So I think London is evolving out of the high risk towards the lower risk scenario. But I guess there'll be other parts of the world now where the high risk is, is uh, very much active. And we also have inpatients in the cancer centre who get acute cardiac problems where we needed to do some remote reviews, occasionally some face to face assessments where it really was critical. And then there were some tamponade cases and some acute coronary syndrome cases in the, in the cancer centre who we had to transfer. And now we're in a sort of phase of how do we go from that where we almost shut down everything physically and went to this remote service to resuming the new normal we've got a big backlog of all the patients who've had deferred so we're now triaging their imaging and their appointments by a sort of red amber green strategy we also predict, although we haven't seen it yet, that the oncology services will have their big backlog. Lots of people did not go and have car investigations for new symptoms or masses. So there's gonna be an oncology surge that will lead to a new cardio-oncology surge that we're gonna to have to deal with. And uh, obviously starting to get back to speed with regular surveillance, whether it's biomarkers and echo, where patients have to leave home to come back in. But I think this has taught us that there is a role for remote consultation. And I think for stable patients, maybe in the future, there will be a group where we can just offer them a, a phone call or video call consultation and save them the journeys into the hospital. And finally, I'll say we've got a business plan to expand our service that was designed before COVID. And with this lot, I hope we'll be coming. So watch this space because I hope we'll have some positions at the Brompton available. And I'm gonna finish with a new technology I'd never heard of before COVID. And this is from our CT team at the Brompton. So I thank them for sharing this data and what they've educated us. And it's all this story of pro-thrombotic state in COVID. So this is called a dual energy CT. It's not routinely available. And I would consider this still a research tool, but essentially it can track the passage of iodine in a contrast of CT pulmonary angiogram using two different energy sources. One that shows the blood vessels, which is what we're used to. And the second, which shows the perfusion of the iodinated contrast into the pulmonary tissue. So here, I, what you can see is a red, this is a normal case. You have a relatively smooth, homogeneous red signal of perfusion in this. This is called, let's call that a healthy control. We see lots of pathology in our patients with COVID, but what then, this doesn't present on this picture, but the next one will, is you see a lot of dropout of perfusion. And a lot of the dropout it does not relate to pulmonary embolus that can be seen on a CT pulmonary angiogram. So this might be microvascular thrombus leading to patchy ischemia in the lung tissue. So on the left is a standard CT of one of our intubated patients with severe COVID pneumonia. And you can see this horrible changes 
with this opacification, lots of patchy consolidation. And as you get to the lower zones, it, you'll see how uh, diseased this patient's lungs are, particularly in the bases. So look at this consolidated lung tissue. On the right, if we try and time them, yeah, you now see the CT, the dual energy CT, and at the top you can see this sort of pepper pot effect. So even in the, the what we felt was less affected tissue, lots of perfusion dropout. Obviously in the big consolidated areas, that's more evident. So what we're seeing is lots of microvascular perfusion abnormalities that go beyond the areas of consolidation. And this together with arterial thrombosis, here's a patient who's got an arterial thrombosis in their ascending aorta, oh, sorry, descending aorta. Uh, so this is at the level of the sort of abdomen, but yeah, so there's the kidneys. So this is a, a thrombus in the middle of their aorta. So there must have been some vasculitis that led to damage, a plaque rupture and a thrombus, even despite their normal arterial blood flow. And most amazing, this is one case where we saw it in the arch of the aorta. So uh, arterial thrombi in the aorta in the absence of sort of other clear abnormalities. And we know there's this thrombosis risk. So I'll just finish by saying, I think there's a high thrombosis risk. This can be exacerbated obviously by people needing to be on ECMO. And so we anticoagulate, but now we're also anticoagulating patients if their D-dimer is more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, even without an ultrasound or CT showing a venous thromboembolism. So, anticoagulating them based on this prothrombotic state. And I think studies are going to come out showing whether that's going to have benefit. But in our experience, this is what we've been doing with certainly our sickest patients. And there are new challenges. I'm now getting referred patients who had COVID in February or March. Maybe they were well enough that they never go, went to hospital, but they've still got symptoms. And when we measure their D-dimers, some of these patients say two weeks, two months after their acute presentation of the viral illness have still got an elevated D-dimer. And I've done a CTPA on cases where a PE has been found, and that's clearly an indication for anticoagulation. But what about the patient with a very high D-dimer and high ferritin who don't have imaging evidence of thromboembolism? We know this is a prothrombotic disease. Should we be anticoagulating them? So I will finish there and be happy to, you know, share experiences because I don't think any of us have the answers and hear how it is around the world and what you've done with your cardio-oncology services at the time of this, this terrible pandemic. So thank you. Alex, that was really uh, fantastic. You probably covered about three hours worth of lecture in that one hour. So uh, congratulations to you. Uh, I can't let uh, a couple of slides ago, uh, you, as you said, you were trying to be provocative, but the facts are that, you know, this, this is from the CDC website that the rates of mortality in the United States are no different now than they were in 2019, 2017 or 18. So, Overall, across the country, there's no change in mortality from any cause. And uh, another tidbit or fact is, is that in New York City, for example, uh, the rate of people dying at home is 10 times higher than it was pre-COVID. Yeah. And basically what I think has happened is obviously COVID-19 is a real entity. And as you pointed out in some of your slides, there were cases several months ago that we didn't quite know what was going on, that it could have been COVID-19 related for sure. Um, but more importantly, I would say is that it's the cancer and heart disease that exists already in these patients that is the real, uh, the real challenge and that, you know, they may have some uh, immediate threat from COVID-19, but their real long-term threat is still the same stuff that we've been dealing with. So 
I think that uh, it's very interesting, you know, to understand that everything in our medical life is focused on COVID-19 right now. But the truth is, is that the existing problems that we were dealing with before COVID were, are still as important as they ever were. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think there's been, you know, there's gonna be a big glut of, of problems being stored up and therefore people presenting with much more advanced complicated disease both cardiovascular and cancer because they've not been getting the appropriate diagnoses and initial treatments i think if you've got either of those diseases cardiovascular disease or cancer or both and you then get covid you're at a really high risk and you know whether you present with something that looks like covid pneumonitis or whether you present with an mi you're still at high risk and that COVID has stirred it up, hasn't it? So um, uh, I'm very surprised that America has not yet measured a Delta increase in mortality because when we saw the pictures coming out of New York and uh, New Orleans, it looked just like how we felt in London. And I know Teresa did in Madrid and colleagues in Northern Italy that you were just being swamped by these people coming into hospitals and very, very unwell um, and then there was this bizarre sort of silence that other diseases had all gone quiet and is it people sitting at home just tolerating symptoms that would not normally be tolerated i mean in the uk we know there was a 40 percent reduction in mi but there was also a 25 to 30 percent reduction in stroke and you'd have thought that if someone had an acute stroke they would still present to medical attention so it's um it's bizarre we've also noticed a massive drop in pollution levels with the cessation of road travel and air travel over our city so one of the other explanations is that with this massive improvement in the environment and, and reduction in in pollution that maybe some diseases that pollution is contributing to drive the inflammatory stimulus in the body and if that disappears for some people maybe that's a, a benefit that they are uh, sort of receiving through the lockdown um, so you know it's complex it is these are all really interesting questions yeah. and i yeah. really thank you for your uh, thank you for your that, presentation who's that? who's that somebody got a question it's susan hi hi dan hey, hi susan. Ella. hi hey, susan. i agree with you i think you know the drop off in people presenting with cardiovascular issues has been noticeable in many of the centers i just wanted to alex that was an amazing presentation i just wanted to let you know that we um in the u.s there is a covid 19 and cancer registry it's a national registry there's over 1100 patients in that registry as of uh, a week ago and we just submitted a proposal uh, to that registry uh, to look at, you know, the cancer uh, patients with cardiovascular disease and outcomes and some of the stuff that you've presented. So hopefully we'll have a bit more data. So I'll, I'll keep you updated. But we just had submitted a proposal last week to look, to access that data. And, and given what we'll, I've left it deliberately on this slide. And you know, we all know cancer patients are at higher risk of venous thromboembolism anyway due to their underlying malignancy. And then you imagine if they get COVID, what the incidence of DVT and PE is in the cancer population. Um, I expect that will be very interesting to see. Right. I'd like, hi, it's Dan, the other Dan from Israel. Hi, Dan. Hi, I'd like to suggest, first of all, thanks for the, special case, great presentation and discussion, and all the new things that I've just learned. What I'd like to comment on, it might be relevant to cardio-oncology, but it's clearly relevant to the COVID concept. As you showed, we all know and are convinced that uh, troponin is a predictor of a bad and worse outcome in deaths. On that, I think we agree. But there is something that is a conception and might be there are some clues that might change it at least partially uh, the belief is that there is a sudden or great descent in the lv function due to myocarditis or other 
uh, specific uh, ways of happening, but there is, I think, some initial uh, suggestion showing that there is not truly a worsening of the LV function. And the reason of a troponin elevation, which stays a predictor, might be due to either the right-sided heart failure, and now I think with thrombosis, we might understand it a little better, and also the solving dysfunction of the LV. So I think it's not the connection between troponin elevation as a predictor, and specifically LV, LV side deterioration is not necessarily or not completely the main issue. I'd like to hear your comment about it because it's, I think, the more question about it rather than uh, things we know. So, Dan, I, I, first of all, I fully agree there is not one pathophysiological cardiac issue in these COVID patients. And I think depending on which population you're looking at, you know, the patients at home in community with symptoms versus those who present to the hospital versus those who need intubation and, and have severe pneumonitis, we'll see different spectrums. So right. we've only really worked in the intensive care. I can think of two cases where they have new severe LV systolic dysfunction with an EF in the range of 10 to 15 percent and actually got better with time, both with troponin elevations and no evidence of coronary disease. Conversely, we got a lot of right heart failure, particularly with pulmonary hypertension in some people because of the burden of the lung involvement, the degree of pneumonitis. But then you think of this thrombo sort of thrombotic problem. And if they've got a PE, it's clearly evident. But even in those without PE on CTPA, we saw these, almost everyone had these patchy uh, sort of perfusion abnormalities on this dual energy PT which is why we've really been therapeutically anticoagulating anyone with a high D-dimer, irrespective of whether you've actually proven on imaging that they've got a DVT, a PE, or an arterial thrombus, because it's probably microvascular. What I don't know is if this happening in the coronaries, and in some of these patients with new LV diastolic dysfunction or more overt systolic dysfunction and troponin rises, could you also be getting a coronary microthrombotic disease? So right, epicardial okay. coronaries look normal. And then there's the virus infecting the muscle, which I think is probably a minority of cases, but there are there are so, uh, case reports already. There was one out of Germany recently in, in the European Heart Journal case reports journal uh, that showed biopsy proven PCR detectable COVID in the inflamed heart. So, you can put it all together and come out with what you wish. I think there's a range of things. It's just like cardio-oncology, isn't it? There's actually a huge range of different pathologies that uh, uh, we're dealing with with this situation. Well, Alex, uh, really fantastic, absolutely wonderful. And I thank you so much for putting so much effort into it. And uh, we really appreciate hearing from you. So thank you all for attending and uh, we'll be We'll be back next week at our usual time for a topic in cardio-oncology. Thank, Thank you, all. everybody, for dialing in. And have a good day and uh, stay safe. All right, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.